Welcome to The Midnight Entrepreneur. I'm your host, Easton Bennett, alongside my fellow co-host, Tyler Sinnon. We are both entrepreneurs who are learning, growing, and building our own businesses. And our goal is to share our experiences and knowledge to help you grow and become a successful entrepreneur. Strap in. Tyler, we're back, moving our filming days to Tuesdays now. So it's a little bit of a different uh, look here. But how is everything going over there in the great white north? It's going pretty good. It's definitely not white up here. It might be white where you are but you know things are going good what about you oh yeah plenty of snow uh down here in north dakota it's lovely you know i just don't understand how we have more snow than canada but we're living with it it's pretty cold i took my truck in today to get fixed so i'm not gonna have a truck for two weeks i think so we're gonna have to get by with that gonna rip the company van around town but other than that things are going well gonna be cruising in style and getting some branding out there Oh, something like that. I should just sell the truck and just drive that around 24-7. But, <laughs> you, you should. Know. Have we talked Some, about that on the on the podcast? What do you mean? Like the branding on the truck or on the van? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if we have. I feel like that would be interesting to talk about. I don't know if you think it's been beneficial for you, but I know you put a lot of time and effort into it, and it was a fairly big decision on for, for your business. Yeah, I think in the beginning I thought this is awesome. And a couple of people mentioned it. And now I don't know if it's like the hype of it has went away, but I'm sure people still see it here and there. Like sometimes when I'm driving past people, they look at the side of the van. Has it led to anything that not sure, not very traceable as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, exactly. It's brand. Yeah. Branding. It always goes deep into the ether. Sometimes you can track it. Sometimes you can't. And that's one of the things I don't think you can track. Unless someone's like, hey, we found you from your van. <laughs> it's like, awesome, bro. Thanks. Uh, yeah. That makes, as, far as, cool. as far as on your end, though, we see you're in a new set. You want to touch on that? Yes, I am. I'm, uh, I got I got in a new studio. we are got a new desk. We're just, you know, building it out a little bit. And so far, I'm finding it to be uh, a little bit productive here, which is, which is good. I... From a previous episode, last episode, you talked about actually getting ready and getting dressed and that helps you being productive. And I started doing that this week and I don't want to attribute me being productive to that. I want to say more so it's because of the setup and uh, it it has everything that I want here and everything that I need. And I'm getting one more thing in the mail Thursday. It's just a sectional that will just be going right behind me and... I feel like we'll be good. We'll, we'll we spent enough money on it and we'll be we'll be chilling for a little bit, but yeah, I'm liking it so far and productivity levels are pretty pretty good. Hey, you can chalk it up to getting ready. I'll take the credit for it if you'd <laughs> like me to. Uh, as you can see, yeah. I didn't really get ready today. I have a sweatshirt and sweatpants on. So I'm going against my own uh I'm going against my own advice, but uh pretty much all day today I have just been doing podcast questions for a couple of interviews tomorrow. And then filming or editing a couple of smaller things. So nothing crazy. I think I sat on my couch, actually. And remember when I said I don't work from my couch? Yeah. <laughs> You're a huge hypocrite. Yeah, 100%. So I sat there and I even thought about it. I'm like, I literally just said on the podcast last week that I don't do this. But so my office you, was cold. And I had a do you work on your iPad? or I, Because I don't think you have a laptop, do you? I have a laptop. I don't use it. That's my old computer I used to use. I have an iPad and I went to grab it from this set actually because it's right here. Uh, That's where the notes are kind of at. And I went downstairs to grab my iPad and I'm like, all right, I'll sit on my couch. I'll do the questions on my iPad. And the iPad was at 0%. So I said, all right, well, better plug that in because I'll need that later uh, for the podcast. And then I plugged it in, just did it on my phone because I just used my Apple Notes uh yeah. for the podcast so yeah that's not something i'm going to do again because there was multiple times i got distracted just having my phone in my hands but we got through with it you like having an ipad for productivity you think that helps like i feel like it's nice and mobile to be able to you know use it on the go or just pick it up and go anywhere you want yeah i like doing it like things like this like you know filming the podcast i don't want to have my whole monitor here that's what i used to do and it got like in the way Uh, So it's nice for things like this, sitting on the couch, that kind of thing, or going somewhere. Like if I'm like, oh, I'll go work at a coffee shop, Uh, mainly because my laptop just dies in literally 15 seconds if I don't have it plugged in. 
So this is super nice, but uh, I don't know. I thought I'd use it a little bit more. I used to use it a lot more, but now that I have my new computer, I just pretty much sit at that whenever I can. Yeah, it seems like that's similar with a lot of new stuff. Same with your van. Once you get it, you're all hyped about it. You're ready to you know, use it. You're all excited. You got your iPad, you're all excited to use it. And then it's just a new thing that comes in and you, know, you get that built up excitement. Yeah, I'm starting to realize that I just like to do start new things, do it for a few months, and then I'm like, I right, need something else to do. So that's an Patience. issue. That is an issue that I have because it's like, ah, oh, it's an iPad. Yeah, whatever. I had an Apple Pencil. I used to draw a bunch of stuff on there, and now I'm like, <laughs> lost my Apple Pencil for a week, and I was like, oh, I don't really need it. So I found it though. But we're here. Any new, uh, any new business endeavors or any new business things that have come up recently, Tyler, before we get into this week's topic? Not really, buddy. I, I don't know if I mentioned it on the last one. He had some surgery, but we're going to be waiting until he's good. We just wrapped up wedding season, so that's all done. And, you know, we're just waiting until buddy's good, and then we're going to be filming, filming the the music videos and he said that he's got the keys to an abandoned warehouse or something so that's going to be where the first one is and he he gave me an idea of what the start is going to look like and i think the middle maybe the end too is going to be throughout the bin in in the abandoned warehouse so not much else there that's pretty sick though you had that one lady reach out about uh real estate photography did that go anywhere yeah, she. I asked where the locations were and like try and get more of the details to give a better price on what she would be getting. And she said that she would be getting back to me with the exact addresses and haven't heard back. So that, that that's a good reminder to maybe reach out to her and be, hey, yep. we still on for this or what's going on? She, she wants it by Christmas, she said. So there's still okay. a good month before that. And I don't think it will it'll take too long so that's pretty good, good then. reminder there you go i'm just throwing out reminders now you're welcome uh <laughs> you got dressed today you're welcome again uh but yeah mm-hmm. on as far on my end i had a i had a meeting with um somebody and i was talking to you about this before their thought process was just so so high level and i remember texting you right away and i'm like man i gotta start thinking like this i gotta not that i'm gonna buy businesses today but it's just there's so much out there where you sometimes pigeonhole yourself into the things you're doing in the way you've always done things that thinking outside yeah. the box a little bit gets you gets your brain firing a little bit. So that's something uh, recently um, got a couple of shoots coming up. Um, nothing crazy. Um, but other than that, yeah, that's that's probably about it for me. I feel like them being on a bigger scale and having much more experience they have a different mindset than where you're at. You're say, maybe you're trying to get to a couple hundred thousand, whereas they're trying to get to multi-millions. Yeah. So it's it's completely different scale where you're trying to get here. What you got to do to get here is a lot different to get to here. Yeah. So it's different paths. And I think you can look at this as like a piece of advice. You can take that as, oh, they're doing better than me and you can feel down on yourself. But the way I looked at it is, he's 20 some years older than me, probably 20 years older than me. And he's there. I'm like, man, I have 20 years to get there. And I already feel like I kind of have a jump start. Like if I could get there in 20 years, I'd be laughing. So you kind of take it as a positive, like, man, I got so much time before I'm even at that point. Yeah. It's the game plan and how long of a time frame that you give yourself. You know, if you have a time frame of a year compared to 10 years, you're going to be doing stuff drastically different. Instead of get rich quick, it's get rich for sure. I love it. I love that saying. All right, let's get into this week's uh, topic. I think we've chatted chatted enough about what's going on. Uh, this week's topic, imposter syndrome. We wanted to touch on this a little bit. Do you think majority of people suffer from this? Or what do you think? Like, We obviously don't have stats on the percentage of people that say they do, but <laughs> what would you say? I, I don't think it's... I don't know. I feel like there is a lot of people. I wouldn't... S- I want to say that it's ebbs and flows. You know, there's not, you're not constantly in that imposter syndrome. It's just something comes up and then you have that imposter syndrome. And then there's, 
you know, a week span, a couple weeks span, you don't really have it. And then something comes up and then you're like, oh crap. Yeah. I don't know if I can do this. I might be in too deep or, you know, I have that mindset where, you know, I don't, I think a lot of people deal with it. Maybe a majority of people, it just, it's just an ebb and flow in the market where, you know, it's not constant. Yeah. Is what I think. What do you think? No, I definitely agree. And a lot of times this is tied to like the beginning of a business or starting a business. And I don't really think it starts as, yeah, I have it. And then it goes away. I think there are times when, like you said, it's like, okay, I know exactly what I'm doing. And then someone presents you with a new project and you're like, holy shit, I have no idea what I'm doing. So I definitely <laughs> think it it goes up and down and it happens to me all the time. Like if someone comes up with a new video idea and they're like, we want to do this effect and have this trend. And I'm like, whew, I've never done that. But we'll figure it out. And then after, obviously, you figure it out, uh, it gets better. And not even like the video side, even the business side of things where it's like taxes, for example. In the beginning, I'm like, oh, I'll just put all my taxes on this spreadsheet. And then I talk to an accountant and they're like, we need to be taxes in LLC and then an S-Corp and then do this. And, th and I'm like, okay, I got a little bit more imposter syndrome now. But yeah, I mean, it, it really goes along with the business. I don't know if it ever really goes away. I think so, too. I I feel like... I want to say Elon Musk might deal with it, but he, I don't know. He probably just has the confidence where he's like, I'm going to figure it out eventually. Yeah. And he, do you think, random question, do you think he thinks to himself that he's the smartest person in the world? I don't know. I don't, th I think maybe, honestly. <laughs> like, I think he thinks he has a solution to every single problem, which he might. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. What do you think? Do you think he does? I I want to say no, because if you think that you know everything, you are you know nothing. Yeah. I think he knows he's uber intelligent. Yes. Maybe not the smartest person alive. Yeah. But I think in he knows certain he's areas freak. he's. Yeah. I think in certain areas he knows he has really good knowledge. But there are going to be other people out there that have more knowledge in this certain area and can help him learn and get better. Oh, 100%. I also saw a tweet that's a little off topic and it said, Quentin Tarantino is a perfect name for that freak. And I was <laughs> I was laughing so hard when I saw that. Uh, but let's go a little bit into, you know, where does imposter syndrome stem from? I personally know that I suffered from it, suffer from it here and there. And I don't even like saying suffer because then it's like, Oh, I have yeah. imposter syndrome, but it's like, so, sometimes I feel that way. Uh, what about you? Have you felt that way before? Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of times where I just have no idea what I'm doing or no idea what to do. And I get asked, Hey, can you do this? And I might say yes. And knowing that I can't do it. And it's like, I'm going to have to learn how to do this and, you know, go into it and try and figure it out. So I, Yes. Yeah. And Do that's you? where 100%. Um, and we have a couple notes on here on where it kind of comes from. And I'll let you touch on this a little bit because you wrote it down. Uh, so upbringing. How do you feel about the upbringing when people, you know, how you were raised? I assume that's what you mean by upbringing. Yeah, for sure. I think it just depends on, you know, the situation that you were given with your parents, family, whatever it was. If you were overpraised, underpraised, maybe your coaches, maybe your friends, whatever it might be. And then, you know, you might just get a lot of different, um, you know, you just, it just stems, stems around. And like, if you get underpraised, you don't think you're ever good enough. And then if you get overpraised, you think everything's good. And then you might get in over your head where you get this really good job or, you know, you land this client and they expect so much from you because of all that overpraise. And you're like, oh crap, I don't actually know all this stuff. And I think a lot of it stems from parenting. You know, that's why people preach, oh, be a good parent. Like, how are you parenting? Like if someone gives you way too much praise, you're going to think that you can do anything. And we all know those people. We know those people. <laughs> we, we grew up with some of them and how they act and that kind of thing. And we also know people that are underpraised where you know how they feel about themselves, low self-esteem. They don't think they can do anything. They're just going to, you know, try to slide under the radar. So I think if you can find that middle ground where it's like, Hey, you can do whatever. It's just going to take a little bit of time. Like you have to humble yourself a little bit. Yeah. Speaking of humbling, Zach Wilson getting humbled. Uh, yeah. Mike White, baby. 
Mike, <laughs> Mike Wade all the way. Mike Wade. Yeah, I think that I think that's really good to happen a lot though is, you know, getting humbled because then you realize you don't know everything that you thought you know or mm-hmm. knew or you aren't as good as you thought you were or, you know, you were given everything and then all of a sudden it got taken away from you and you're like, "Oh crap, I actually have to put in work. I have to actually do stuff to get to where I want to go and it's not going to get handed to me." Yeah, so how do you feel about this stemmed in my mind? How do you feel about the whole fake it until you make it terminology or that movement where people just say, oh, just fake it until you get to where you want to be? I think you need to do it to a certain level because it. if you don't, I feel like you're not pushing yourself or you're not really... Because when you're faking it and trying to make it, you're going out there learning new things and you're maybe getting new clients, doing new things, and you're learning along the way. So I think there is a certain point to where you have to do it, but maybe you don't want to go excessively. You know, there's always that fine line that you want to balance on. I think you do it out of a necessity to get your, you know, to get yourself to that next level. The people that do it almost scammy, where it turns into, it's almost like a scam. That's where it starts to bother me a little bit. Yeah, I agree. All right, I next. Think so too. Yeah, next thing on our notes here, we talked about. Um, did you kind of talk about fools to other, or uh, you think you fooled others to think? We kind of talked about that a little bit, right? To doubt your own skills. Yeah, yeah. It was. It stemmed with overpraised and underpraised. Yeah, and then I think they all s- somewhat tie into it. Where you know, if you were underpraised growing up, you ha- you don't really have that self-confidence and whenever you do say achieve something or something really good happens to you you might accredit it to success or your success to luck because you know you'd never thought that you had those skills because you never got that praise growing up (coughs) oh excuse me i've had a really bad throat lately so it's just you know if i'm losing my voice a little bit this episode um but yeah no i 100 percent agree with you talking about society's pressures i know you have that on here I think this is something I felt a lot is that if it's almost like if you're going to fail, that there's so much pressure on you to be successful and people can then be like, ha ha, point finger, I was right, you failed, you weren't going to be right, where there's so much pressure from society to be successful. Do you ever take that into yourself to like, hey, I'm going to prove these people wrong? I want to say I do, but recently I've noticed that I'm really self-motivated and I try not to, you know, show what I'm doing and say what I'm going to do. I want to actually do do it and Just then you'll it. be able to see. Yeah, exactly. So there is a lot of society's pressure where, you know, family will ask you, how, how's stuff going? How's this? How's that? Friends and family, whatever it might be. And then you're always seeing these other people too. And comparison is the thief of joy. And you're seeing all these other people where they're being really successful and you see someone else get a promotion or someone else land a client. And then you're like, am I not good enough? Am I not able to do that? Like, why is that person able to get it? And that actually did happen to me the other a couple of weeks ago where I saw someone and I was like, am I just not good enough to, you know, be, be that person to land those clients. Mm -hmm. And that's something you mentioned, you know, kind of flying under the radar, not telling people what you're doing. One thing I always think to myself is never let people know your next move. I know that sounds super like mysterious and whatever, but I try to keep like when family members ask you, oh, how's business going? Like, what are you working on? I just keep it as vague as possible because I'd rather it's so much more satisfying when you accomplish something and then people see it and they're like, oh, I had no idea he was doing that or that this was going on. And then you just put it out there and it's like, boom, there it is. Instead of like, hey, I'm going to write a book one day. And then you take five years to write it and people are like, how's that book going? Or one day you just drop a book and they're like, I didn't know you were writing a book. It always sucks whenever people ask you. And then that, that it can either go two ways where it either demotivates you because you're not making good progress on it or you're not making good progress on it. And people ask you and you want to be able to say, I'm doing really good. It's coming along well. So I think it, it depends. It might be on if you're overpraised, underpraised, which way you lean towards when people ask you. If you're doing, how is it going? So, yeah. It almost gets into the psychology. Is that the right word? I always get that yeah. and uh, sociology mixed up. What's sociology about? No idea. 
Yeah. See, me neither. <laughs> Let's go psychology. <laughs> uh, so I want to yeah, talk. A, I want to talk a little bit about blind confidence. I think to start a business, you have to go into it a little bit with some blind confidence, thinking like, "Hey, I, I'm like, I know exactly what I'm doing. This is how the business is going to go. It's going to go awesome." I know the first business I started, the clothing company. I went in there thinking that I was going to turn it into the next like sauce hockey, the next bar stool clothing, whatever. And then after a while, you figure out that, okay, maybe this is a little bit harder than I thought. But do you think it's important to have a little bit of blind confidence going in or at least some sort of confidence? I think some sort of confidence for sure, because if you don't really have that confidence, I don't know how far you're going to really get because you're not going to know what you're doing. So I don't know. I don't know where your blind confidence stems stems from. Do you know where you you maybe stem from? I don't know. Maybe it could be like the parent thing where it's like, Hey, you're, you're a great kid. You're the best kid ever. But I don't think they really did that, but it's just the confidence. I don't know where the confidence of myself started from, but thinking, Hey, I can start a business. And I think it's just the thought on the back end of knowing I can figure it out. Yeah. Like if something comes up, I'll figure out how to do it. Uh, it's not like I'm gonna, something's coming up. I'm like, oh, well, I lose. I lost. So I think it was the thought of, hey, I can figure this out no matter what's thrown at me. It might get difficult, but I can figure it out. And that's kind of where the confidence stemmed from. Yeah, you have the skills and knowledge to either get through it or if you don't, you know that you're going to be able to go out there and learn it and you know put it into action. Yeah. When you started Nuevo, did you have some sort of blind confidence or some confidence going in? Probably, uh, <laughs> you know, it, we were both in marketing, so it's, we were, you know, we're, we're like, this is going to be easy. We know how to market. Yeah. We're going to, we've watched YouTube videos. We know how to do everything. So I'm going to say, yeah, we did We did. But then it, once you start doing everything, you realize that it's a lot harder than what everyone says. And, you know, it takes a lot more work, time and effort to actually grow it and build something sustainable i think there's so much hidden effort that people don't realize my sister sent me a tiktok yesterday or two days ago and it was some sort of drop shipping something or another selling on fba oh it's cheeseburger holders and someone was buying 10 cent cheeseburger holders from alibaba and then they were selling them F- amazon fba and they were making all this money and she sent it to me and she said should we try this and I just kind of, I just kind of internally chuckled, thinking about how much work actually goes into something like that. And I don't think the majority of people know that. Okay, yeah, you see all these TikTokers, and they're like, "Oh, just drop ship, you make all this money." But how much work actually goes into something like that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure we talked about, or you sent me one maybe about like the full breakdown, or maybe I just saw it on my own. But people showing like the full breakdown of what actually goes into Amazon FBA, you actually have to have the startup cost to be able to source the products, ship it to Amazon warehouses. Once you get it to Amazon warehouses, then you got to be able to set up your Amazon site, which I believe you have to pay for. I think it's a monthly fee. Then additionally, on top of that, Amazon takes a chunk out of every order. And then additionally, on top of that, there's marketing that you can do where you can pay for sponsorships to be able to put yourself at the top. So there's a lot of additional expenses that go into it. So it's a lot harder than just taking on these products, throwing it on Amazon, and then you sell out Reaping your million. You, yeah. you, you're making $3 per prof or $3 per product profit on each one. Yeah. A lot of that profit goes into the expenses and there's a lot more expenses than people might realize or show in these videos. We've got to start a movement to get people to know this stuff. I'm gonna I com- feel like people are. I'm going to comment on drop shipping videos and be like, it's not true. <laughs> Yeah. You can't do it like that. <laughs> yeah. There's so many people wanting to get into it too. Everyone's like, this is like the new hot thing. Everyone's trying to get into it. Everyone's doing it. And, you know, you see those videos and everyone's talking. I want to do this. I want to do this. How do I get into this? What should I do? Should I do this? Should I do that? Yeah. And people are just really wanting to get into it. It's the new hot craze. It's like, buy my everyone's course like, and I'll teach you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Those people, that's what I don't get. That this one video I saw, I, I feel like we're getting a little bit off topic here, but I saw this one video. This guy starts out, I, I followed him at the time too, because, you know, I thought he was giving out good information. Starts out the video. I'm going to be, I'm going to make a million dollars this Christmas. 
And then by the end of the video, it finished with, and you're not going to do it because you're a piece of shit. Ooh. And I'm like, how does this connect? You start out from <laughs> you making a million dollars this Christmas to me being a piece of shit because I'm lazy. <laughs> There's no, he basically should have, you know, he's got to work on his copywriting for, yeah. for his videos because there's a huge disconnect. It should have said, if you want to make a million dollars this Christmas, do this and then finish with, but you're probably not going to do it because you're a lazy piece of shit. Yeah. I like how... Instead of saying, I'm going to do it. That's a great plug at the end of the video. You're a piece of shit, buddy. He calls you up. Yeah. Hey, Tyler, watching yeah. this video. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to comment on it, but I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to unfollow this guy. Comment on his beer. I used to be a piece of shit. I used to be. <laughs> People can change. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So getting back into the topic a little bit more, imposter syndrome, turning point. I had a turning point, and I think it's when I bought the filmmaking course. Because when I went into it, imposter syndrome, I had none of it. Right? At the beginning, I was like, let's go. Blind confidence. I'm going to make a million dollars filming videos. I got these videos. I worked on a few, you know, a few months down the road. Then I bought this course, full-time filmmaker. I just saw the absolute plethora of content and the amount of information. I had no idea about any of it. And I was like, yeah. Holy, I was like, Oh my God, maybe, yeah. I, maybe I think, I'm not cut out for this industry. I think that's what, where your blind confidence stems, stems from. You don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So you think you know everything until you start getting hit with stuff that you don't know. So it's like, Right now, I know everything because I can do anything. But once you start getting, say, this job or that job or, you know, with this client, then you're like, oh, crap, I guess I don't know everything. Yeah. And that's it's a blessing and a curse. You have to work through those things to figure out what you don't know, because a lot of times you would never know until you run into a scenario like that. But you also have to take it as, OK, it's a like you said, it's a little bit humbling. You got to humble yourself and then learn those things. And then obviously you're going to grow. Next thing you're going to be like, oh, I don't know how to do this. So I think if you can somehow pivot your imposter syndrome into more of a learning experience, you're going to have a better mental outcome while going through the business journey. Yeah, I think it's just having that mindset that you're constantly wanting to learn and willing to learn because that's pretty much what it is. You're always learning. And, you know, if you're not not getting better you're not learning so you know if you want to learn or if you want to get better you got to learn and there's no really rules it's kind of just like everyone thinks there's such a strict set of business rules it's like you just do things every day and then you learn something and then you do it over here it is like people say it's just this one big gain it's really yeah. weird to think about from the macro side of things yeah play monopoly over here right i just need a monop <laughs> i just need a monopoly on my uh industry that's all i ask for really i'm gonna put that on my christmas <laughs> list all right so let's talk about some pricing stuff uh so there may be a disconnect in the price you charge and you may not see value in what you're charging so that's something that i've struggled with before you have imposter syndrome because you're charging people these amounts of money but what for is your product or service worth what you're charging them yeah so it's like, yeah. how do you, how do you, how have you personally battled that, Tyler? Or I've tricked struggled yourself into with thinking this. It? Yeah, I've, I've struggled with this a little bit because we were talking about it and, you know, we lowered our prices to try and get a connection there where we can see the value in this price for this product. And that's been a little struggle. And that's one area that I'm trying to, you know, get better in. And I think it's just knowing like the process and knowing the value that you can provide, say for, if you're able to have a service and you charge $3,000 for it and you can guarantee someone $10,000, you can obviously see the ROI there. You yeah. know, if you pay me $3,000, you're going to get $10,000. So you get $7,000 profit. So it's, you know, it's stupid to not take that deal. So it's trying to find that connection where, the, you see the value in what you're charging. The one part I struggle about that, if you have a product, let's say I'm filming an ad where it's like, if you spend $2,000 on this ad, hopefully you get $10,000 back in sales. Where it's difficult to explain to people is branding. If I'm creating yeah. a video that's a brand video, what does that uh -huh. really, what does that really get you? How do you calculate that ROI? And that's still something I don't really have an answer to. 
I think it's brand awareness. You got to go in there with your, with the client and be, Hey, what's, what's a KPI here? What's going to be, you know, a, an ideal outcome. If we make this video and 100 people now know of your name and when they see your brand logo or see this and they can say, Hey, that's been a creative media or what it might, whatever it might mm -hmm. be. I think you got to be able to establish that before, but that's really hard to track to say, hey, you know, yeah. how does 100 people know of, know of us now? So. Yeah. And that's, it helps when you're posting stuff on social media. If it's like, okay, if 50,000 people see this video, awesome. Then it calculates something. But yeah, having those key performance indicators is something I started doing a year, two years ago, starting to have that conversation with clients. Instead of just, oh, I can make a cool video. It'll look really cool. The shots will be cool. Okay, but what's the purpose yeah. of it? So if you can figure out what value you're providing, I think you'll have less of that imposter syndrome than going in there and be like, I'm charging them way too much money. I don't know why they're paying me. I don't really know what it's getting them. That's kind of where the imposter syndrome stems from, I think. it's You feel like you're ripping these people off. Did you ever have that when you were first starting out or were you just pricing yourself so low that you didn't didn't even think that I think I was pricing myself low or I was just happy with it and in the grand scheme of business <laughs> after doing it for four years you realize that there's way more money to be thrown around than what I was charging if I was like oh I'll do it for two hundred dollars yeah. okay well some that person might have just went out and bought a speaker randomly for two hundred dollars you know what I mean so two hundred dollars at the time wasn't very much but now if I come to someone and say hey it's four thousand dollars okay now they got to think about it a little bit more um, so I think in the beginning, I just had no idea. I was just like 200 bucks. Oh my gosh, someone's going to pay me. Uh, but now that I'm doing it, there are times I get projects where people are like, Hey, we really want this. Like this is our vision. This is how much money we have. And I'm like, I don't know how this is going to help you, but we'll do it, which I should mentally start being like, okay, let's have this conversation. Let's see if we can pivot. But when people come in with a solid idea, a plan and everything and just want my labor, it's hard, yeah. to, it's hard, it's hard to steer them in a different direction. Yeah. So it seems like starting out, you maybe didn't have enough value there. And then you were able to reevaluate what you were offering. How, how were you able, how were you able to offer more value to, to the clients? So you were able to charge more. I think it's just for me personally, it's adding content and then so let's say instead of one video we're doing a campaign where it's three videos plus social media pieces and then also creating videos with a purpose so for example for shooting a father's day ad we want to know okay we want this company to think yep these people care about fathers here's the campaign they're putting out for it 50,000 people are going to see it. And then that in turn shows them next time they think of something, oh, this company really cares about this thing. So I think it's one, adding content and then two, creating content that actually is for a purpose or for some type of KPI or whatever it might be instead of just like, all right, let's do it. And then just handing it to them. Yeah, I think I think there was an, there's more areas that you're able to say this is the amount of value that I'm giving you. I think a few of them is the gear. Yep. You got a lot more and better gear and experience. You have a lot more experience, knowledge, and skills, and then you're able to charge a lot more. You know, you have all these other projects under your belt. You learned a lot along the way, and now you have a lot more skills to be able to create a better product to deliver them. And I think it's quality too. Everyone thinks they can film a video on their iPhone. If a client's like, well, we can do it for $500. I'm like, okay, but are you getting four people on set? And then are you getting, you know, professional lighting, a professional camera, a slider, professional audio, or are you just getting a camera on a tripod uh, using window light, which not saying that's bad. If you're on a budget for sure, go for that. But you know, you pay for what you get. So if I show up and with five people with me, and then you're getting this high quality produced commercial that in turn shows your clients or customers, well, this is a high-end company. Like, look at the content they're putting out. They must be a high-end company. Whereas if you're a, you know, a dental office that's just iPhone videos and it's shaky and it's like, okay, well, this they don't really care about their image to the public. What kind of company uh -huh. are they? 
You know what I mean? Yeah. I saw one one thing where a business was just filming on their phone and it's just a little walkthrough and it's just, you know, run and gun type of deal. Mm -hmm. And I saw someone comment on it. The guy's kind of a douche, but he's just commenting about how shit it was. It's like, this is such terrible quality. This is, how would you ever trust a company like this that's shooting this to uh, do, do or to get your business? Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, it's like these basic videos where, you know, you're just doing a little walkthrough of like a project or, you know, it's just a quick little, doesn't it's not high production type of thing it's just something quick and easy to share on social media yeah you always get those haters and i think there's a mix if you're showing your company to the public there are times where an iphone video is good if it's just like hey we're doing a drawing we're doing a giveaway film with your iphone pull something out of a hat call the name right that type of content's fine or if you're doing a quick like hey this is what our new lobby looks like and you just kind of do a pan awesome but if you're doing highly produced commercials or a brand video or a testimonial that's when you want to put the effort towards it to actually show that you care and that you're like, okay, our company is not a shitbox company. We'll put some dollars toward this. Exactly. So, I mean, that helps when you're adding value. Um, that's kind of what, what I wanted to talk about on the value side. Do you have anything more on here? I'm looking. Do you have anything that you add to your offers to make it a grand slam offer? I like to give free stuff after and I don't tell them. So it's like, hey, we're going to do a brand video, a testimonial video, and then a 30 second video, whatever it is. And then when I deliver the video, it's like, hey, here's your two and a half minute video. But I also chop the two and a half minute brand video up into a 30 second piece. And they're like, oh, we didn't, you know what I mean? It's like a bonus. We never discussed it. We never talked about, hey, I'm going to give you this extra stuff. It just adds value like, hey, you paid for this. I know you didn't or you paid for the three videos. I know you didn't pay for these social media pieces, but, you know, here's five more pieces that you can use. And it doesn't take too much time out of my workflow, but it is more perceived value to the client or customer. When you're talking with the potential client and they're on the fence about it, then do you bring it up? Yes, I have before where you kind of hint at it like, hey. You know, we can also, if I, if I want to close the deal, if I'm like, Hey, it's $2,000 for these two videos. And they're like, eh, I'm like, okay, it's $2,000 for these two videos plus five social media pieces. And then if they feel like, okay, I'm getting a little bit more, I'm getting a little bit more for my, for my dollar. And I, we were talking about, uh, Alex Ramosi's book, the grand slam offer, uh, or hundred million dollar offers. I was called. Yeah. Something, something like, like that. that. And I was listening to it last night cause I have it at an audio book. And he said that he would provide an offer, obviously an offer that you couldn't say no to. And I was thinking to myself, what if I told 10 businesses, I'm like, hey, $1,000, you get this for it. And it usually costs you $15,000. Because he, it was a section of the book where they're talking about generating cash flow. And I'm like, that's not actually a horrible idea. Obviously, it's going to be a lot of work on your end. But if cash flow is a problem, you can create an offer like that where it's, it would be stupid for people to say no. I don't know how far in the book you are, but it's adding a lot more value onto your original offer. So for you, maybe if you have, I'm trying to think on the spot with, you get like a business and maybe you go to a couple different businesses in town and I'm trying to think of something related, but you basically say you go to a chiropractor in town and then if you they become a client of yours, you say, I have this photography person. She'll do one free shoot for you guys. And, you know, it's just baking in a bunch of extra stuff like that. I can't really think on the spot. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm tough. It's tough. So it's just baking in, like trying to find some partnerships with, say, a photographer. Um, you know, maybe you have a website guy or. A, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just having these additional offers where it's like, if you go with me, you get all this additional stuff for free. And, you know, if you wanted to do this and actually pay for it, this is probably going to cost you a lot of money. Yeah. And, and it's I, just baked into the price. And even something I just thought when you brought that up, it's like, hey, if we do this video together, you're also going to get access to this back end 20 videos showing you how to utilize the content we're making. 
It's like, that's totally yeah. free. You get this mini course or whatever it is. Plus you get this free photography thing. Plus we'll give your team new headshots from so-and-so. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, there you go. I gotta, there you go. Headshots. I, gotta, I like that. Sounds like I got to finish the book is what you're telling me. Yeah, you do. It's a really good book. You just got to take a lot of the stuff that he says and actually implement it because he says a lot of good stuff. Yeah. I like audiobooks because I was listening to last night in the shower and then usually I listen to music in the shower. I'm like, let's throw this book on. And then like 30 minutes later, I'm like, I'm still in the, I'm still in the shower. <laughs> but yeah, no. Uh, Coming up with business ideas on your wall. You got a waterproof marker. I was literally thinking last night I could be writing like with an expo marker on my shower, like in front of me. But I was like, Cause I was like, God, I, need go. a Bus- no- I need a notebook or something. Business idea. There we go. We'll talk about that one next week. Uh, that's a perfect transition. <laughs> into our business idea of the week. Do you have anything to touch on imposter syndrome before we move on? I don't think so. I think a lot of it comes down to confidence and you gain confidence being on the job with experience, with knowledge, gaining knowledge, wanting to learn. And, you know, we all deal with imposter syndrome. And I think a good thing to evaluate is how far you've come. Look where you started, look where you are now and look how far you've come. You're learning constantly. You know, you're being put through the ringer when you're being put through the ringer, you're learning so much, you're gaining experience and, you know, and imposter syndrome probably happens to almost everyone, if not everyone. Yeah. And that's the one thing you have to know. It's normal. Don't feel like it's just you. It happens to so many people. So let's go into business idea. Tyler, it is your turn. We're going to, I have to pick one of these two. I'm going to go with the TFL. I have no idea what it stands for, but that's what we're going with. So this was an idea I had so many years ago and then I ended up doing a business project on it for DECA. And since then, I've seen a business do it, but there is some differences there. But basically what it stands for is the Fantasy League. I think so. Okay. Something like that. Makes sense. And basically basically what it is, is creating a fantasy league where people can join because I was working with one guy and he said he joined a fantasy league for a thousand dollars. I'm like, holy shit. Like, I can't believe like, and the thing was he joined like three random ones and one of the random ones was a thousand dollars. I'm like, if this guy's willing to do this for a thousand dollars, completely random, why not just have a massive site where you can have everyone in, in there? And wait, what did I say? The fantasy the lottery? Fantasy, the fantasy. fantasy. You said the fantasy league. The fantasy lottery. Okay. The fantasy lottery. I think that's what it is. Okay. So it, it becomes a lottery. And I don't know if you know of Underdog, but it's very similar to what they do where they have best ball drafts and basically you, you know, pick your players and it you don't have to set your lineup or anything. So you're able to do as many as as you want and you can have hundreds of them. You don't have to worry about setting your lineup. So I think that's one good aspect to include with it. But basically what it is, is you host a bunch of different um, leagues on your website and they're all completely random. And you can have either a subscription fee for a year or... I think there. I think the idea was to have a subscription fee, fee for the year, and then you have the additional fee for the league. So, say each league costs a twenty dollars, hundred dollars, whatever you want it is. Yeah. And then each buy-in, you take a portion of that, you put it to the lottery, and you take the other portion, and then that's going to be towards each league. So okay. you're going to be in several different leagues, and there's going to be a couple different prizes. The first one is within your league. So you can be the best person in your league. You can win that league buyout. And the other big one is the lottery. So when you take the initial buy-in, you put that buy-in to the lottery. And basically, it counts your points for. Whoever has the most points for wins that lottery. And maybe you can have it tiered a little bit. So like first prize, plot prize gets the big lottery, second, third, and then maybe fourth, fifth, and then six through 10 or something get get a prize as well. So it's basically calculating everyone in there and then it's like this whole massive lottery and that's, you know, you're the best fantasy player in the world is what you can basically classify yourself as. So it's so it's like leaderboards for fantasy. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And it's basically calculated by how many points you put up every week would be the the, the lottery and then you would have your... So it keeps you engaged throughout it 
But I think adding the best ball format is really good because then you don't have to worry about setting your lineup every week. How would you do it where <clears throat> if I'm in 10 leagues and you're in three leagues, the point's four? Yeah, you're going to be in separate leagues. So I'm not sure if I'm understanding it correctly, but you, you can have different leagues. So um, for example, maybe every league is a 12-man league. You have your set lineup with like two quarterbacks, two running backs, two receivers, yep. tight end, flex, whatever. And in the best ball format, you don't have to set your lineup. It just takes whoever has the most points for. Yep. It just puts them in that spot. So you don't have to set your lineup every week, and then you're going to be in several different leagues. So you're not going to be have 10 teams in one league. It's going to be one team in this league, and then one team in this league, one team in this league. So how many people are in one specific league? Uh, you can do 10-man, 12-man, whatever. I okay. think you would have to choose it. And then it's the same thing across. So maybe you just do a 12-man league, and that's the same thing across every single league. Yeah, but what I'm saying is if, like, what if I want to play in five different leagues, okay? I want to play in two $20 leagues, a $100 league, and then two $10 leagues. But what if Jimmy only wants to play in $100 league? How does his five teams go into the lottery compared to Jimmy's one team into the lottery? It would be the same thing. It would just be your $100 buy-in would just be different because that's going to be the league payout. So say for the league payout, I forget what the percentages was, but say, we'll say 1%. What is 1% easy to calculate? We'll say 1%. Sure. 1%. So 1% of 20, I think is $2. Maybe. No, that's probably way 10%. off. Yeah, that's 10%. Okay, 10% of every league yep. goes towards the lottery. So basically... If you go into a $20 league, we're going to take $2 from each person that buys in. Yep. And then that's going to go towards the lottery. The $100 league, oh shit, that doesn't add up. So I think it's just like a set amount from every league. So I think it's like $5 from every league. So if you're in the $100 league, you just take like $5 out. And then if you're in the $20 league, you take $5 out. It just would shrink your payout for that individual league. So then it would just be $15 from each person in that league. So 12 by 15, um, quick math. <laughs> but what We're I'm saying is way if, too long. if I join five leagues and Jimmy only joins yes. one, I have a better chance of winning the lottery because I'm in five leagues. hundred percent. Okay. It all depends. The, this one guy that I watch, he joined like several hundred different best ball leagues for an underdog. But I don't think it'd be fair if... I think there almost needs to be tiers. So let's say all the $100 leagues have their own lottery. The $20 leagues have their own lottery. Because if I do $1,000 league and then you do 50 $20 leagues, well, you have 50 different teams to beat my one team. And we're still pulling from the same pool. Yeah, we could do that. The, the only issue would be that the lottery is going to get split up a lot more. The thing is, if you wanted to, you could just do the same thing that they're doing where you're just in that $20 league. But yeah. it Because I feel like it makes more sense. Just, let's say there's a thousand people in the $100 leagues. Let's say there's $1,200 leagues, okay? And there's a thousand people in it. All the money from the $100 leagues going to a $100 lottery. And then if you want to have five teams in the $100 league, have, have at it. It's going to cost you 500 bucks. But if mm -hmm. I want to play $51 leagues, okay, well, then everyone in the $1 league column, that's our lottery. So then I have a we chance. We can't do $1 to, leagues. Well, whatever it might be. Oh, yeah, I suppose the percentages. But let's say there's $10 leagues. If you want to do 50 teams in the $10 leagues and cost you 500 bucks, you have 50 chances to win. But you're also, the lottery might be a little bit smaller. Yeah, that's true. I think maybe that then it would just be one, one set fee. Then yeah. It would just be, say... Every league's twenty dollars, or every league's fifty dollars, or maybe twenty dollars. Just you know, because people would be more willing to buy in at that price. Yeah, but I mean, it it, it also helps because you have the league winning fee. If I go in a hundred dollar league and I win it, I get more money back. So if you're not worried about the lottery, if you just want to win the league, then that could, yeah. that could be something to look at too. Yeah, there's some kinks in there, but this was an idea that I came up with. Man, I don't know how long ago that would have been. I feel like that in would be or? close to before that. It would be really? it would be about 10-ish 10, years ago. Yeah, I've had this idea for a long time. It's been 
baked up there for a long time. <laughs> and now Underdog <laughs> stole it from you. Semi. Half stole it. Yeah. Somewhat. Yeah. I just Our, never took action. Oh, exactly. Uh, we'll Unfortunately. Save, we'll save this uh, second business idea for two weeks from now. I'm going to come up with next week's business idea. Um, other than that, I think, we, I think we're good to go, Tyler. What do you think? Yeah, I think we're good to go home. What do you think? Time to go home. I want to go home. Yeah, I'm going to go eat a pizza. Actually, that's the plan. <laughs> good food. <laughs> All right, that's, ep- that's episode 14 of The Midnight Entrepreneur. If you have any questions you'd like us to cover or answer, you can email us at the midnight entrepreneur at gmail.com. If you found value in this content or found this entertaining, share this with a friend or post it on your story. If you really enjoyed the show, we'd love a rating and review on wherever you're listening. Talk to you guys next week for another episode of The Midnight Entrepreneur.